The Coral Island by R. M. Ballantyne. Chapter Three. The Coral Island. Our first cogitations after landing, and the result of them. We conclude that the island is uninhabited. There is a strange and peculiar sensation experienced in recovering from a state of insensibility which is almost indescribable, a sort of dreamy, confused consciousness, a half-waking, half-sleeping condition, accompanied with a feeling of weariness, which, however, is by no means disagreeable. As I slowly recovered and heard the voice of Peterkin inquiring whether I felt better, I thought that I must have overslept myself, and should be sent to the masthead for being lazy. But before I could leap up in haste, the thought seemed to vanish suddenly away, and I fancied that I must have been ill. Then a balmy breeze fanned my cheek, and I thought of home, and the garden at the back of my father's cottage with its luxuriant flowers and the sweet-scented honeysuckle that my dear mother trained so carefully upon the trellised porch. But the roaring of the surf put these delightful thoughts to flight, and I was back again at sea, watching the dolphins and the flying fish, and reefing topsails off the wild and stormy Cape Horn. Gradually the roar of the surf became louder and more distinct. I thought of being wrecked far, far away from my native land, and slowly opened my eyes to meet those of my companion, Jack, who, with a look of intense anxiety, was gazing into my face. "'Speak to us, my dear Ralph,' whispered Jack tenderly. "'Are you better now?' I smiled and looked up, saying, "'Better. Why, what do you mean, Jack? I'm quite well.' "'Then what are you shamming for and frightening us in this way?' said Peterkin, smiling through his tears, for the poor boy had been really under the impression that I was dying. I now raised myself on my elbow, and putting my hand to my forehead, found that it had been cut pretty severely, and that I had lost a good deal of blood. "'Come, come, Ralph,' said Jack, pressing me gently backward. "'Lie down, my boy.' you're not right yet. Wet your lips with this water. It's cool and clear as crystal. I got it from a spring close at hand. There now, don't say a word. Hold your tongue, he said, seeing me about to speak. I'll tell you all about it, but you must not utter a syllable till you have rested well. Oh, don't stop him from speaking, Jack, said Peterkin, who now that his fears for my safety were removed, busied himself in erecting a shelter of broken branches in order to protect me from the wind, which, however, was almost unnecessary, for the rock beside me which I had been laid completely broke the force of the gale. "'Let him speak, Jack. It's a comfort to hear that he's alive after lying there stiff and white and sulky for a whole hour, just like an Egyptian mummy. Never saw such a fellow as you are. Ralph, always up to mischief.' You've almost knocked out all my teeth and more than half choked me, and now you go shamming dead. It's very wicked of you, indeed it is. While Peterkin ran on in this style, my faculties became quite clear again, and I began to understand my position. What do you mean by saying I half choked you, Peterkin? said I. What do I mean? Is English not your mother tongue? Or do you want me to repeat it in French by way of making it clearer? don't you remember? I remember nothing, said I, interrupting him, after we were thrown into the sea. Hush, Peterkin, said Jack, you're exciting Ralph with your nonsense. I'll explain it to you. You recollect that after the ship struck, we three sprang over the bow into the sea? Well, I noticed that the oar struck your head, and gave you that cut on the brow which nearly stunned you so that you grasped Peterkin round the neck without knowing apparently what you were about. In doing so, you pushed the telescope, which you clung to as if it had been your life, against Peterkin's mouth. Pushed it against his mouth, interrupted Peterkin. Say, crammed it down his throat. 
Why, there's a distinct mark of the brass rim on the back of my gullet at this moment. Well, well, be that as it may, continued Jack. You clung to him, Ralph, till I feared you really would choke him. But I saw that he had a good hold of the oar, so I exerted myself to the utmost to push you towards the shore, which we luckily reached without much trouble, for the water inside the reef is quite calm. "'But the captain and crew, what of them?' I inquired anxiously. Jack shook his head. "'Are they lost?' "'No, they are not lost, I hope. But I fear there is not much chance of their being saved. The ship struck at the very tail of the island on which we are cast. When the boat was tossed into the sea it fortunately did not upset, although it shipped a good deal of water and all the men managed to scramble into it. But before they could get the oars out, the gale carried them past the point and away to leeward of the island. After we landed I saw them endeavoring to pull towards us, but as they had only one pair of oars out of the eight that belonged to the boat, and as the wind was blowing right in their teeth, they gradually lost ground. Then I saw them put about and hoist some sort of a sail a blanket, I fancy, for it was too small for the boat, and in half an hour they were out of sight. Poor fellows, I murmured sorrowfully. But the more I think about it, I've better hope of them, continued Jack in a more cheerful tone. You see, Ralph, I've read a great deal about these South Sea Islands, and I know that in many places they are scattered about in thousands over the sea so they're almost sure to fall in with one of them before long. I'm sure I hope so, said Peterkin earnestly. But what has become of the wreck, Jack? I saw you clambering up the rocks there while I was watching Ralph. Did you say she had gone to pieces? No, she has not gone to pieces, but she has gone to the bottom, replied Jack. As I said before, she struck on the tail of the island and stove in her bow but the next breaker swung her clear, and she floated away to leeward. The poor fellows in the boat made a hard struggle to reach her, but long before they came near her she filled and went down. It was after she had foundered that I saw them trying to pull to the island. There was a long silence after Jack had ceased speaking, and I have no doubt that each was revolving in his mind our extraordinary position. For my part, I cannot say that my reflections were very agreeable. I knew that we were on an island, for Jack had said so, but whether it was inhabited or not I did not know. If it should be inhabited, I felt certain from all I had heard of South Sea Islanders that we should be roasted alive and eaten. If it should turn out to be uninhabited, I fancied that we should be starved to death. Oh, thought I, if the ship had only struck on the rocks we might have done pretty well, for we could have obtained provisions from her, and tools to enable us to build a shelter. But now, alas, alas, we are lost! These last words I uttered aloud in my distress. Lost, Ralph! exclaimed Jack, while a smile overspread his hearty countenance. Saved, you should have said. My cogitations seem to have taken a wrong road and led you to the wrong conclusion. Do you know what conclusion I have come to? said Peterkin. I have made up my mind that it's capital, first rate, the best thing that ever happened to us, and the most splendid prospect that ever lay before three jolly young tars. We've got an island all to ourselves. We'll take possession in the name of the king. We'll go and enter the service of its black inhabitants. Of course we'll rise, naturally, to the top of affairs. White men always do in savage countries. You shall be king, Jack, Ralph, Prime Minister, and I shall be the court jester, interrupted Jack. No, retorted Peterkin, I'll have no title at all. I shall merely accept a highly responsible situation under government. For you see, Jack, I'm fond of having an enormous salary and nothing to do. But suppose there are no natives. Then we'll build a charming villa 
and plant a lovely garden round it, stuck all full of the most splendiferous tropical flowers, and will farm the land, plant, sow, reap, eat, sleep, and be merry. But to be serious, said Jack, assuming a grave expression of countenance, which I observed always had the effect of checking Peterkin's disposition to make fun of everything. We are really in rather an uncomfortable position. If this is a desert island, we shall have to live very much like the wild beasts, for we have not a tool of any kind, not even a knife. Yes, we have that, said Peterkin, fumbling in his trousers pocket, from which he drew forth a small penknife with only one blade, and that was broken. Well, that's better than nothing. But come, said Jack, rising, we are wasting our time in talking instead of doing. You seem well enough to walk now, Ralph. Let us see what we have got in our pockets, and then let us climb some hill and ascertain what sort of island we have been cast upon, for, whether good or bad, it seems likely to be our home for some time to come. End of chapter 3 Recording by Tom Weiss The Coral Island by R. M. Ballantyne Chapter 4 We examine into our personal property and make a happy discovery. Our island described. Jack proves himself to be learned and sagacious above his fellows. Curious discoveries. Natural lemonade. We now seated ourselves upon a rock and began to examine into our personal property. When we reached the shore after being wrecked, my companions had taken off part of their clothes and spread them out in the sun to dry, for although the gale was raging fiercely, there was not a single cloud in the bright sky. They had also stripped off most part of my wet clothes and spread them also on the rocks. Having resumed our garments, we now searched all our pockets with the utmost care, and laid their contents out on a flat stone before us, and now that our minds were fully alive to our condition, it was with no little anxiety that we turned our several pockets inside out in order that nothing might escape us. When all was collected together, we found that our worldly goods consisted of the following articles. First, a small penknife with a single blade, broken off about the middle and very rusty, besides having two or three notches on its edge. Peterkin said of this, with his usual pleasantry, that it would do for a saw as well as a knife which was a great advantage. Second, an old German silver pencil case without any lead in it. Third, a piece of whip cord about six yards long. Fourth, a sailmaker's needle of a small size. Fifth, a ship's telescope, which I happened to have in my hand at the time the ship struck, and which I had clung to firmly all the time I was in the water. Indeed, it was with difficulty that Jack got it out of my grasp when I was lying insensible on the shore. I cannot understand why I kept such a firm hold of this telescope. They say that a drowning man will clutch at a straw. Perhaps it may have been some such feeling in me, for I did not know that it was in my hand at the time we were wrecked. However, we felt some pleasure in having it with us now although we did not see that it could be of much use to us, as the glass at the small end was broken to pieces. Our sixth article was a brass ring which Jack always wore on his little finger. I never understood why he wore it, for Jack was not vain of his appearance, and did not seem to care for ornaments of any kind. Peterkin said it was in memory of the girl he left behind him, but as he never spoke of this girl to either of us, I am inclined to think that Peterkin was either jesting or mistaken. In addition to these articles, we had a little bit of tinder and the clothes on our backs. These last were as follows. Each of us 
had on a pair of stout canvas trousers and a pair of sailor's thick shoes. Jack wore a red flannel shirt, a blue jacket, and a red Kilmarnock bonnet or nightcap, besides a pair of worsted socks and a cotton pocket handkerchief with sixteen portraits of Lord Nelson printed on it and a Union Jack in the middle. Peterkin had on a striped flannel shirt, which he wore outside his trousers and belted round his waist, after the manner of a tunic, and a round black straw hat. He had no jacket, having thrown it off just before we were cast into the sea, but this was not of much consequence, as the climate of the island proved to be extremely mild, so much so, indeed that Jack and I often preferred to go about without our jackets. Peterkin had also a pair of white cotton socks and a blue handkerchief with white spots all over it. My own costume consisted of a blue flannel shirt, a blue jacket, a black cap, and a pair of worsted socks, besides the shoes and canvas trousers already mentioned. This was all we had, and besides these things we had nothing else but when we thought of the danger from which we had escaped, and how much worse off we might have been had the ship struck the reef during the night, we felt very thankful that we were possessed of so much, although, I must confess, we sometimes wished that we had had a little more. While we were examining these things and talking about them, Jack suddenly started and exclaimed, "'The oar! We have forgotten the oar!' "'What good will that do us?' asked Peterkin. There's enough wood on the island to make a thousand oars. Aye, lad, replied Jack, but there's a bit of hoop iron at the end of it, and that may be of much use to us. Very true, said I. Let us go and fetch it. And with that we all three rose and hastened down to the beach. I still felt a little weak from loss of blood, so that my companions soon began to leave me behind. But Jack perceived this, and, with his usual considerate good nature, turned back to help me. This was now the first time that I had looked well about me since landing, as the spot where I had been laid was covered with thick bushes, which almost hid the country from our view. As we now emerged from among these and walked down the sandy beach together, I cast my eyes about, and truly my heart glowed within me and my spirits rose at the beautiful prospect which I beheld on every side. The gale had suddenly died away, just as if it had blown furiously till it dashed our ship upon the rocks, and had nothing more to do after accomplishing that. The island on which we stood was hilly, and covered almost everywhere with the most beautiful and richly colored trees, bushes, and shrubs, none of which I knew the names of at that time, except, indeed, the coconut palms, which I recognized at once from the many pictures that I had seen of them before I left home. A sandy beach of dazzling whiteness lined this bright green shore, and upon it there fell a gentle ripple of the sea. This last astonished me much, for I recollected that at home the sea used to fall in huge billows on the shore long after a storm had subsided. But on casting my glance out to the sea, the cause became apparent. About a mile distance from the shore I saw the great billows of the ocean rolling like a green wall and falling with a long, loud roar upon a low coral reef, where they were dashed into white foam and flung up in clouds of spray. This spray sometimes flew exceedingly high and every here and there a beautiful rainbow was formed for a moment among the falling drops. We afterwards found that this coral reef extended quite round the island and formed a natural breakwater to it. Beyond this the sea rose and tossed violently from the effects of the storm, but between the reef and the shore it was as calm and smooth as a pond. My heart was filled with more delight than I can express at sight of so many glorious objects, and my thoughts turned suddenly to the contemplation of the Creator of them all. I mention this the more gladly because at that time, I am ashamed to say, 
I very seldom thought of my Creator, although I was constantly surrounded by the most beautiful and wonderful of His works. I observed from the expression of my companion's countenance that he too derived much joy from the splendid scenery, which was all the more agreeable to us after our long voyage on the salt sea. There the breeze was fresh and cold, but here it was delightfully mild and when a puff blew off the land it came laden with the most exquisite perfume that can be imagined. While we thus gazed we were startled by a loud huzzah from Peterkin, and on looking towards the edge of the sea we saw him capering and jumping about like a monkey, and ever and anon tugging with all his might at something that lay upon the shore. "'What an odd fellow he is, to be sure,' said Jack taking me by the arm and hurrying forward come let us hasten to see what it is here it is boys hurrah come along just what we want cried peterkin as we drew near still tugging with all his power first rate just the very ticket i need scarcely say to my readers that my companion peterkin was in the habit of using very remarkable and peculiar phrases and i am free to confess that I did not well understand the meaning of some of them, such, for instance, as the very ticket, but I think it is my duty to recount everything relating to my adventures with a strict regard to truthfulness in as far as my memory serves me. So I write, as nearly as possible, the exact words that my companion spoke. I often asked Peterkin to explain what he meant by ticket but he always answered me by going into fits of laughter. However, by observing the occasions on which he used it, I came to understand that it meant to show that something was remarkably good or fortunate. On coming up we found that Peterkin was vainly endeavoring to pull the axe out of the oar into which, it will be remembered, Jack struck it while endeavoring to cut away the cordage among which it had become entangled at the bow of the ship. Fortunately for us, the axe had remained fast in the oar, and even now all Peterkin's strength could not draw it out of the cut. "'Ah, that is capital indeed!' cried Jack, at the same time giving the axe a wrench that plucked it out of the tough wood. "'How fortunate this is! It will be of more value to us than a hundred knives, and the edge is quite new and sharp. I'll answer for the toughness of the handle, at any rate cried Peterkin. My arms are nearly pulled out of the sockets. But see here, our luck is great. There is iron on the blade. He pointed to a piece of hoop iron as he spoke, which had been nailed round the blade of the oar to prevent it from splitting. This also was a fortunate discovery. Jack went down on his knees, and with the edge of the axe began carefully to force out the nails. But as they were firmly fixed in, and the operation blunted our axe, we carried the oar up with us to the place where we had left the rest of our things, intending to burn the wood away from the iron at a more convenient time. "'Now, lads,' said Jack, after we had laid it on the stone which contained our little all, "'I propose that we should go to the tail of the island, where the ship struck, which is only a quarter of a mile off, and see if anything else has been thrown ashore.' I don't expect anything, but it is well to see. When we get back here, it will be time to have our supper and prepare our beds. Agreed, cried Peterkin and I together, as, indeed, we would have agreed to any proposal that Jack made, for, besides his being older and much stronger and taller than either of us, he was a very clever fellow, and I think would have induced people much older than himself to choose him for their leader, especially if they required to be led on a bold enterprise. Now, as we hastened along the white beach, which shone so brightly in the rays of the setting sun that our eyes were quite dazzled by its glare, it suddenly came into Peterkin's head that we had nothing to eat except the wild berries which grew in profusion at our feet. "'What shall we do, Jack?' he said with a rueful look. "'Perhaps they may be poisonous.' "'No fear,' replied Jack confidently. 
I have observed that a few of them are not unlike some of the berries that grow wild on our own native hills. Besides, I saw one or two strange birds eating them just a few minutes ago, and what won't kill the birds won't kill us. But look up there, Peterkin, continued Jack, pointing to the branched head of a coconut palm. There are nuts for us in all stages. So there are, cried Peterkin, who, being of a very unobservant nature, had been too much taken up with other things to notice anything so high above his head as the fruit of a palm tree. But whatever faults my young comrade had, he could not be blamed for want of activity or animal spirits. Indeed, the nuts had scarcely been pointed out to him when he bounded up the tall stem of the tree like a squirrel, and in a few minutes returned with three nuts, each as large as a man's fist. "'You had better keep them till we return,' said Jack. "'Let us finish our work before eating.' "'So be it, Captain. Go ahead,' cried Peterkin, thrusting the nuts into his trousers' pocket. "'In fact, I don't want to eat just now, but I would give a good deal for a drink. Oh, that I could find a spring, but I don't see the smallest sign of one hereabouts. I say, Jack, how does it happen that you seem to be up to everything?' You have told us the names of half a dozen trees already, and yet you say that you were never in the South Seas before. I'm not up to everything, Peterkin, as you'll find out ere long, replied Jack with a smile, but I have been a great reader of books of travel and adventure all my life, and that has put me up to a good many things that you are, perhaps, not acquainted with. Oh, Jack, that's all humbug. If you begin to lay everything to the credit of books, I'll quite lose my opinion of you, cried Peterkin with a look of contempt. I've seen a lot of fellows that were always poring over books, and when they came to try to do anything, they were no better than baboons. You are quite right, retorted Jack, and I have seen a lot of fellows who never looked into books at all, who knew nothing about anything except the things they had actually seen and very little they knew even about these. Indeed, some were so ignorant that they did not know that coconuts grew on coconut trees. I could not refrain from laughing at this rebuke, for there was much truth in it as to Peterkin's ignorance. Humph, maybe you're right, answered Peterkin, but I would not give tuppence for a man of books if he had nothing else in him. Neither would I, said Jack but that's no reason why you should run books down, or think less of me for having read them. Suppose now, Peterkin, that you wanted to build a ship, and I were to give you a long and very particular account of the way to do it. Would not that be very useful? No doubt of it, said Peterkin, laughing. And suppose I were to write the account in a letter, instead of telling you in words, would that be less useful? Well, no, perhaps not. Well, suppose I were to print it and send it to you in the form of a book. Would it not be as good and useful as ever? Oh, brother, Jack, you're a philosopher, and that's worse than anything, cried Peterkin with a look of pretended horror. Very well, Peterkin, we shall see, returned Jack, halting under the shade of a coconut tree. You said you were thirsty just a minute ago. Now, jump up that tree and bring down a nut. Not a ripe one, bring a green, unripe one. Peterkin looked surprised, but seeing that Jack was in earnest, he obeyed. Now cut a hole in it with your penknife and clap it to your mouth, old fellow, said Jack. Peterkin did as he was directed, and we both burst into uncontrollable laughter at the changes that instantly passed over his expressive countenance. No sooner had he put the nut to his mouth and thrown back his head in order to catch what came out of it than his eyes opened to twice their ordinary size with astonishment, while his throat moved vigorously in the act of swallowing. Then a smile and a look of intense delight overspread his face, except, indeed, the mouth which, being firmly fixed to the hole in the nut, could not take part in the expression, but he endeavored to make up for this by winking at us excessively with his right eye. At length he stopped, and drawing a long breath exclaimed, Nectar! 
perfect nectar. I say, Jack, you're a Briton, the best fellow I ever met in my life. Only taste that, said he, turning to me and holding the nut to my mouth. I immediately drank, and certainly I was much surprised at the delightful liquid that flowed copiously down my throat. It was extremely cool, and had a sweet taste, mingled with acid. In fact, it was the likest thing to lemonade I ever tasted, and was most grateful and refreshing. I handed the nut to Jack, who, after tasting it, said, "'Now, Peterkin, you unbeliever, I never saw or tasted a coconut in my life before, except those sold in shops at home, but I once read that the green nuts contain that stuff, and you see that it is true.' "'And pray?' asked Peterkin. What sort of stuff does the ripe nut contain? A hollow kernel, answered Jack, with a liquid like milk in it, but it does not satisfy thirst so well as hunger. It is a very wholesome food, I believe. Meat and drink on the same tree, cried Peterkin, washing in the sea, lodging on the ground, and all for nothing. My dear boys, we're set up for life. It must be the ancient paradise. Hurrah! and Peterkin tossed his straw hat in the air and ran along the beach, hallooing like a madman with delight. We afterwards found, however, that these lovely islands were very unlike paradise in many ways, but more of this in its proper place. We had now come to the point of rocks on which the ship had struck, but did not find a single article, although we searched carefully among the coral rocks which at this place jutted out so far as nearly to join the reef that encircled the island. Just as we were about to return, however, we saw something black floating in the little cove that had escaped our observation. Running forward, we drew it from the water, and found it to be a long, thick leather boot, such as fishermen at home wear, and a few paces farther on we picked up its fellow we at once recognized these as having belonged to our captain, for he had worn them during the whole of the storm in order to guard his legs from the waves and spray that constantly washed over our decks. My first thought on seeing them was that our dear captain had been drowned, but Jack soon put my mind more at rest on that point by saying that if the captain had been drowned with the boots on he would certainly have been washed ashore along with them and that he had no doubt whatever he had kicked them off while in the sea that he might swim more easily. Peterkin immediately put them on, but they were so large that, as Jack said, they would have done for boots, trousers, and vests too. I also tried them, but although I was long enough in the legs for them, they were much too large in the feet for me. So we handed them to Jack, who was anxious to make me keep them, but as they fitted his large limbs and feet as if they had been made for him, I would not hear of it, so he consented, at last, to use them. I may remark, however, that Jack did not use them often, as they were extremely heavy. It was beginning to grow dark when we returned to our encampment, so we put off our visit to the top of the hill till next day, and employed the light that yet remained to us in cutting down a quantity of bows, and the broad leaves of a tree of which none of us knew the name. With these we erected a sort of rustic bower, in which we meant to pass the night. There was no absolute necessity for this, because the air of our island was so genial and balmy that we could have slept quite well without any shelter, but we were so little used to sleeping in the open air that we did not quite relish the idea of lying down without any covering over us. Besides, our bower would shelter us from the night dews or rain, if any should happen to fall. Having strewn the floor with leaves and dry grass, we bethought ourselves of supper. But it now occurred to us, for the first time, that we had no means of making a fire. Now, there's a fix. What shall we do? said Peterkin, while we both turned our eyes to Jack to whom we always looked in our difficulties. Jack seemed not a little perplexed. "'There are flints enough, no doubt, on the beach,' said he, "'but they are of no use at all without a steel. However, we must try.' 
So saying, we went to the beach and soon returned with two flints. On one of these he placed the tinder, and endeavored to ignite it, but it was with great difficulty that a very small spark was struck out of the flints, and the tinder, being a bad hard piece, would not catch. He then tried the bit of hoop iron, which would not strike fire at all, and after that the back of the axe with no better success. During all these trials Peterkin sat with his hands in his pockets, gazing with a most melancholy visage at our comrade, his face growing longer and more miserable at each successive failure. "'Oh, dear,' he sighed, "'I would not care a button for the cooking of our victuals. Perhaps they don't need it, but it's so dismal to eat one's supper in the dark, and we have had such a capital day that it's a pity to finish off in this glum style. Oh, I have it, he cried, starting up. The spy-glass, the big glass at the end is a burning glass. You forget we have no sun, said I. Peterkin was silent. In his sudden recollection of the telescope he had quite overlooked the absence of the sun. Ah, boys, I've got it now, exclaimed Jack rising and cutting a branch from a neighboring bush, which he stripped of its leaves. I recollect seeing this done once at home. Hand me the bit of whipcord. With the cord and branch Jack soon formed a bow. Then he cut a piece about three inches long off the end of the dead branch, which he pointed at the two ends. Round this he passed the cord of the bow, and placed one end against his chest, which was protected from its point by a chip of wood. The other point he placed against the bit of tinder, and then began to saw vigorously with the bow, just as a blacksmith does with his drill while boring a hole in a piece of iron. In a few seconds the tinder began to smoke. In less than a minute it caught fire, and in less than a quarter of an hour we were drinking our lemonade and eating coconuts round a fire that would have roasted an entire sheep, while the smoke, flames, and sparks flew up among the broad leaves of the overhanging palm-trees, and cast a warm glow upon our leafy bower. That night the starry sky looked down through the gently rustling trees upon our slumbers, and the distant roaring of the surf upon the coral reef was our lullaby.